Hi friends. All right, we just discussed 18, 19, and 20 and left off with Isabel not knowing where Ruth went off to. Um, we are gonna read two chapters, 21 and 22. Lou is on her special secret. Oh, she's not. She left the loop. <laughs> she knew she was on the Lou cam, so she left. <laughs> Close the look here. And Boone is at work. Twenty one and twenty two. I think twenty one is pretty long. All right, this is from the diary of Ebenezer Wild, 1st Massachusetts Regiment. His Excellency General Washington arrived in camp this afternoon in consequence of which 21 cannon were discharged from the American park. The whole army paraded and paid him the honors due to his rank. I moved through the crowded streets as fast as I could without breaking into a run. She's gone to watch the parade, I tried to convince myself. She'll want to see the fine horses that the officers ride upon. Scarier possibilities galloped into my brain pan. What if she's been kidnapped? What if she's lost? What if she's hurt? I stopped thinking and simply prayed. Please keep her safe, please keep her safe, please keep her safe. The words matching the hasty beat of my boots on the cobblestones. The army was now so large it spilled over Williamsburg from end to end and miles beyond. I had to slow down as I reached the thick crowd of townsfolk who had come out to gawp at the new arrivals. The sun was sinking into the low hanging dark clouds to the west. The wind snapped the regimental flags with a sound like distant musket fire. Sergeants shouted orders to their men. There were thousands and thousands of soldiers spread over miles of camp. I needed help. I needed Curzon. I pulled away from the crowd of townspeople and hurried into the middle of the encampment. Lanterns were being lit, pork and beef were roasting over fires, fiddles and pipes playing. Men and boys laughed and sang and called to one another as sparks from hundreds of campfires rose into the darkening sky. I followed the sharp smell of charcoal burning on a forge seeking the regimental blacksmiths. None of them had seen a lad matching Curzon's description or hired one. I couldn't find her or him and he had lied about working at a forge. Panic clawed its way up my throat. I wanted to scream Ruth's name over and over again, but that would bring unwelcome attention that could harm us all. Shouting for Curzon should, would do me no better. Should I seek out Aberdeen? Should I go back to the laundry? Should I inquire with a continental officer or would I have better luck if I spoke with a French gentleman? What if I never see her again? Suddenly I heard the loud braying of an irritated donkey a familiar, annoying donkey whose noise seemed to my ears like the trumpeting of a host of angels. Thomas Boone. I turned my head to locate the source of the noise, then followed it past four rows of tents to a clearing that had become a small village of its own. With settlers selling their wares while soldiers ate, conversated, and played at cards and dice. At the far edge of the clearing, Thomas Boone had his ears laid back and was showing his teeth at a tall soldier dressed in continental dark blue. The man laughed loudly, grinning, as did Curzon, who slapped the fellow on the back. The most momentous shock came from the sight of my sister. Ruth was sitting in the donkey cart and laughing with the two as if, as I had not heard her laugh since she was seven years old. Whatever the cause of the mirth, she laughed hard enough to clutch her belly and wipe a laugh tear from her eye. I hurried over. What possessed you to run off like that? I asked Ruth. You scared me to death. Don't you know how dangerous? Hold up there, Curzon touched my elbow. She didn't run off. I stopped at the laundry just as she returned from her delivery. Told the old lady with a pipe to tell you be, we'd be with the 1st Massachusetts Regiment near the settlers. You swear you told her that? He gave me a look of frustration. Have I ever lied to you? I arched an eyebrow in reply. About anything important, that is, he added. Ruth has been with me the whole time. She didn't run off. You want to holler at someone, then holler at the old woman, though. She'll probably throw you out on the street if you do. Apologies, I said to Ruth. I didn't mean to shout at you. I reached for the lead rope, feeling confuddled and out of sorts. We need to go back. Wait, wait, Curzon said. There's no rush, no danger. 
Don't you remember Ebenezer? Good evening to you, Miss Gardner, the tall soldier bowed. Is it still Miss Gardner or have you become a married lady? I gave him a quick study. His leave stopped short of his wrists and his coat was not big enough to be buttoned over his broad chest. His freckled face was smudged with dirt, as were his hands. He looked like a thousand other soldiers I'd seen, except he was a full head taller than most. But when he flashed a gap-toothed grin, I knew him in an instant. Ebenezer Woodruff, Curzon's friend from the battlefields of Saratoga, who'd helped us escape Valley Forge. Good evening, Mr. Woodruff. I inclined my head a bit, unsure of what else to do. He's Sergeant Woodruff now, Curzon said with a grin of his own. Sergeant, I said politely. Congratulations. "'Tis a delight to find you here,' Ebenezer gave the hint of a second bow, and to make the acquaintance of Miss Ruth. Seems you have many adventures to tell." His courtly manner surprised me. The Eben Woodruff I remembered was a rough-cut and bumbling farm boy, though south-hearted, stout-hearted, and loyal. Didn't seem possible he could grow up into a sergeant. "'This is not the best time nor place to tell about them,' I said. "'Indeed,' Eben said. "'Mayhaps I could come round some eve. We could go for a stroll.' His eyes darted to Curzon. All of us, of course. I had the oddest sensation that he was trying to be charming to me. The notion so flustered me I could not think clear for a moment. Have you heard how General Washington fooled the British into thinking he was about to attack New York? Curzon asked me with delight. Ebenezer and the rest of the Northern Army have been racing down here to meet up with the French, which is the best strategic maneuver ever. He looked more like his old self than he had in months, alert but at ease, a half smile in his mouth. Despite his bad experience with the army, he was always in the highest of spirits when it was close by. The note of longing in his voice pierced through me. It didn't matter if he worked for a regimental blacksmith or drove a supply wagon or armed himself with a shovel and worked as a laborer. The dream proclaimed by the big wigs in Philadelphia of a nation built on freedoms excited his mind like nothing else. Curzon had paid his debt to me. It was clearer than ever that this was where he wanted to be. The encampment seemed darker, as if the fires were all burning low. I shook once with a chill, feeling very alone, even though I was surrounded by thousands of souls. I forced a false, polite smile. I'm afraid that's a tale best saved for another time. We need to get back to the laundry. No, we don't, Curzon argued. You don't, I corrected, but Ruth and I do. Get back in the cart, sister. Ruth crossed her arms over her chest and sulked. I'd be honored to escort you, Ebony Zier offered. Not necessary, you rogue, Herzon said. I'll see them safely out of the camp. You should see if there's any supper left. There's never enough supper, Ebenezer smiled ruefully. I was mistaken when I told you that eating was the best part of soldiering, wasn't I? In any case, good evening to you all. Stop by later, old friend, and I'll tell you more about, he glanced at me and seemed to temper his words, about what we discussed earlier. Curzon was a regular Mr. Ramblemouth as we made our way back through the town, nattering on about all the news he'd learned from Ebenezer. The army's lightning quick march from New York, the defeat of the British in West Florida by the troops of the Spanish King, and tales of their old friends from Valley Forge. As we passed the market, he turned and caught me staring at him. Why the glum face, he asked. Aren't you excited? I waited until we'd walk clear of a thick knot of people before I answered. Why should I be excited? His Excellency has come to town, he replied, as if the answer were an obvious one. The better part of our army is here, ready to fight shoulder to shoulder with the French, who care even less for the British than we do. I can taste the victory, I tell you. You hammer horseshoes, I said, or rather you would, if be, if you were in fact working for a blacksmith. You lied about that, didn't you? There are many ways to stop the cause of freedom. Help the cause of freedom, he began, puffed up and putting on an air as if he were a statesman or other sort of fool. A pox on your ridiculous notions, I said. Ruth slapped the reins to make Thomas Boone walk. She began humming a fife song that had been played near Eben's campfire. Curzon and I walked the next block without speaking. We used to argue endlessly about the revolution. He was a firm believer in the patriot cause. He loved to prattle on about the Declaration of Independence and how the United States of America promised to be a new sort of nation. I was forever reminding him that we'd been enslaved by both patriots and loyalists, and that neither side was talking about freedom for people who looked like us. Things had grown so heated that we'd had to agree not to discuss it. What if I was thinking of enlisting again, he asked. And now the conflict had cracked open in our laps once more, stinking like a rotted egg. I stopped. I'd say you were an adulpated fool. 
He acted as, as if he hadn't heard me. If we can defeat Cornwallis, it could well mean the end of the war. Now that the French are openly helping us, King George fears he'll, he'll lose his lands in the Caribbean as well as America. General Washington needs all the skilled soldiers he can get. He threw back his shoulders. Like me, I snorted. Where was the good general when the army handed you over to Bellingham? Did his excellency intervene because of your fine soldiering skills? Of course not. He owns hundreds of slaves himself. The patriots fight only to be free of British taxes. They don't care a whit for your freedom nor mine. That's changing, he argued. Balderdash, I replied. Ruth's gaze went back and forth from my face to Curzon's as we argued. Her hum changed to a loud whistle. Did you not see how many sons of Africa are soldiers in uniform back there? He pointed back toward the encampment. Black men make up a goodly portion of it, as many as one in five or one in four by some counts. In fact, your beloved Rhode Island has a regiment with fellows earning their freedom by fighting as continental soldiers. Earning, I pointed out, not earned, which means by the end of the war, if they survive, some varmint judge could well clap them back into chains. We'd be better off running to the British. My words shocked him like a slap to the face. Have you lost your senses? Actions speak louder than words, I said. The redcoats don't promise a soldier's uniform or bad battlefield glory. They just put fugitive slaves to work, but they work in freedom and can leave whenever they wish. The blasted British want to enslave our entire country, Curzon yelled. His voice was so loud that heads turned. A small group of soldiers clustered at a tavern door, shouted at a hearty huzzah, and lifted their mugs in approval of his sentiments. You are a muzzy-headed blatherskite, I muttered, and you're a vexatious cabbage head, he replied. Stop fighting, Ruth said. I don't like it. Neither did I, though I was not prepared to say it aloud, not when Curzon was afloat on his patriot patriarchal fantasies of war. We walked in silence until the sign of the Grey Boar Tavern came into view. Curzon halted the donkey just beyond the reach of the light that spilled out of the windows. I have something to say. I put my shoulders back and tried to present myself in a calm manner, ready for his apology, prepared to ask forgiveness for my own sharp tongue, and to have a proper confab about how we could get away from this danger-soaked place. I'm listening, I said in a gracious tone. Curzon removed his cap. I enlisted three days ago. I was so stunned I could not speak for a moment. The distance that had been growing between us suddenly became a separation. He had torn the cloth of our friendship in two. You have a bizarre attachment to a cause that cares nothing for you, I finally said. He cast down his eyes and scuffed at the dirt with the toe of his boot. Figured you'd say something like that. Thomas Boone shook his head. Ruth leaned forward and patted his rump. Curzon cracked his knuckles. You must choose a side, Isabel, he said softly. Rebel or red coat? I am my own army, I said. My feet and legs, my hands, arms, and back, those are my soldiers. My general lives up here. I tapped my forehead, watching, watching for the enemy and commanding the field of battle. This is not an occasion for jesting. I am dead serious, I said. Neither redcoats nor rebels fight for me. I see no reason to support them. He stared at me intently. What do you fight for then? I don't want to fight anymore. I want to be as far away from armies and war as possible. I want to live the rest of my days without fear. He frowned. No one wants to be in a war, but that is our circumstance. You must choose a side, else you'll become a target for both. I hesitated. If we'd had this conversation the previous winter, I might have added that I wanted him at my side. I might have confessed that he'd make a fine husband for me and that I would be a fantastical good wife. But between us now lay a poisonous swamp of misunderstandings, arguments, hurt feelings, and sadness. What do you fight for, I asked. Freedom. The firm resolve on his face made him look like someone I barely knew. Freedom for everyone. That's a cause worth dying for, don't you think? You can't help anyone if you're dead, I said. At least I care enough to try. What do you mean? The rest of the world can go hang for all you care. The rest of the world hasn't done me any favors. What about me, he demanded. You've done your share as I did for you. So the accounts between us are balanced, he asked in a raw voice. You're well satisfied that I owe you nothing, having helped you recover Ruth. I can tell you that you owe me not a single thing. Done and done. I swallowed hard. Is that how the columns add up to you? Indeed they do, Miss Gardner. He stepped away from me, his eyes hard and angry. I shall take my leave of you now.
Do as you wish, I said, trying to ignore how badly his words hurt. You need not trouble yourself with us anymore. Don't you worry, country, he said in a voice that cut through me. I shall never trouble you again. Chapter 22. This is a letter from St. George Tucker to his wife, Fanny Tucker. Among the plagues the British left in Williamsburg, that of flies is inconceivable. It is impossible to eat, drink, sleep, right? sit still or even walk about in peace on account of their confounded stings. Their numbers exceed description unless you look into the chapter of Exodus for it. Curzon was true to his word. Days passed, some filled with cold rain, others with an, old, an unwholesome stifling heat, but none of them brought any sign of him. He ended our friendship, I told myself firmly. He chose his own path. I stirred boiling pots of breeches and shirts. I carried trays into the tavern. I split wood, hung laundry, I heated irons and hauled water, taking on extra tasks in an effort to tire myself out and drive the thoughts of him from my mind. I worked and worked and worked to quiet the sorrowful truth. He chose the war over me. More French and American soldiers arrived each day, the air filled with dust and the noise of thousands of men practicing their musket firing and maneuvering drills. Hundreds of wagons, heavy with supplies and tools, crowded the roads. Animals, too. Horses for pulling the wagons and carrying officers, and cattle, sheep, and pigs destined for the butcher's quarrel. Corral. To round out the rations, countless barrels of flour, cornmeal, salt, beans, and peas were unloaded from boats at the river landing. The tavern was so busy that I was often sent there to serve at mealtimes, and sometimes to help with the washing up as well. Mr. Hallahan promised to pay me extra for tavern work as soon as the Continentals settled their accounts with him. I gladly took on the work. It was much easier to learn of the circumstances of the war in the tavern than in the laundry. A captain eating bean soup at the Gray Boar loudly proclaimed that the encampment held more people than the great city of Boston. The other men argued with him, but the captain had seen the muster rolls and the numbers did not lie, he said. Mr. Hallahan poured a steady stream of ale, wine, and rum for his customers. Miss Morrow prepared pots of barley soup, roasted rabbits, and onion pies, and I carried all of it to the tables. Messengers rode in and out of the town in anxious clouds of dust, sometimes stopping at the gray boar to quench their thirst. Everyone was starved for the latest news from Richmond and Philadelphia, including me. When I could, I smuggled newspapers under my skirts and read them in the privy. Spain and the Netherlands had promised to help America. The third son of King George, a young fellow called Prince William Henry, was in the British held city of New York. I thought mayhaps the Redcoats might crown the lad King of the United States. I was not certain if that would end the war or guarantee that it dragged on for generations. In the same newspaper, I found the word Aberdeen, referring to the city in Scotland. I tore it out to give to our Aberdeen the next day so he could learn the spelling of his name. Though I still did not trust him entirely, he was as regular as a well-wound clock, and it cheered Ruth to be in his company. I vowed to watch him closer to see if I could figure why it was that she so preferred him to me. Our second full Sunday in Williamsburg, Widow Hallahan reluctantly gave us leave to attend church. We walked slow, for it was a glorious day, bright skies, gentle breeze, no stained breeches to scrub. I considered not going to church at all, but Mama would not have approved of that. She'd taken us to a small clabbered-sided congregational church when Ruth was a baby. They didn't have churches like that here. Aberdeen had heard of a man named Gowan who preached in the Baptist manner to slaves and free folk. I wanted very much to hear this Baptist manner, but the congregation met in a grove miles away, and I could not afford the time nor the risk of searching for it. We headed for the big brick church in the center of town, Bruton Parish Church. I studied Ruth's gait as she walked. Her foot was healing rapidly, helped no doubt by being able to eat every day and sleep soundly each night. I still didn't have a good measure of her abilities. One day I'd think certain she had the mind of a child of five. The next I'd see a flash, a spark that made me suspect she understood quite a bit more. She was clever enough to know when Elspeth tried to give her extra chores. She would tell the kinds of falsehoods that an ordinary lass of 12 might tell, pretending she hadn't eaten in the last of the bread or that she had no idea how the ashes had been dumped just outside the door instead of in the ash barrel. When I confronted her about her small lies, she simply crossed her arms and stared over my shoulder. 
She talked to the donkey, to Elspeth, Kate, Aberdeen, Widow Hallahan, and even the old lady's friends who dropped by with a small bit of washing. But if I entered a room, she'd like as not snap shut her mouth like an irritated turtle and crawl into her shell. Even on her best day, she rarely spoke more than a handful of words to me. But as we walked to church, she cheerfully greeted every cat, dog, pig, and sparrow we passed. Outside the church, we watched as gentry and army officers entered the gentlemen doffing their hats, the ladies smiling. If we joined them, we'd be required to walk up narrow stairs and sit in the upper gallery. That was the only place for black-skinned folk. When we lived in New York, I'd thought that being in the gallery meant our prayers would get to God first because we sat closer to heaven. I was wrong. All it meant was that the white people in church wanted to chain our souls as much as our bodies. Instead, I positioned Ruth and myself under a mulberry tree at the edge of the graveyard, close enough to the church that we could hear the prayers and hymns through the open windows. A scraggly half-grown hound bounded between the gravestones and rolled on his back so that Ruth could scratch his belly. I leaned against the trunk of the tree and delighted in the luxury of a moment's peace. Had it been only two weeks since we arrived in Williamsburg, the minister's sermon floated on the breeze, pray for the happy period when tyranny, oppression, and wretchedness shall be banished from the earth, when universal love and liberty, peace, and righteousness shall prevail. I bowed my head. Most every person sitting upon the fine pews in their owned people who had been kidnapped from their families or held in bondage from birth. The foul hypocrisy of the sermon made me want to scream loud enough, loud and long enough to make the church, the governor's palace, the laundry, even the building used for a hospital crumble like the walls of Jericho. Maybe then the walls around their hearts would fall too. The congregation entered into song, praising God and his mercy. I prayed. I thanked God for leading me to Ruth. I asked him to help me in my constant struggle to hold my tongue and control my temper and become a patient person. I asked him again to soften Ruth's manner toward me and to help me show her how much I loved her. I tried to pray for Curzon's safety, but my confuddled sentiments had me thinking that he deserved to be shot in his backside, and that made me feel the worst sort of devil. My mother and the Lord himself would be disappointed in me for such thoughts. I sighed at my failure. Ruth looked up. You poorly? Nay, I said. You sound like a sick horse, she imitated my sigh in an overdramatic fashion. Time to go back, I said, starting for the road, and I am not a horse. She, met her, she muttered something that sounded like, tis a shame. <laughs> I began to hope that the coming battle might continue to be postponed. I cared not what would cause this, what gunpowder would suffice, or an outbreak of the bloody flux suffered by both armies, if the American and French would stay content in Williamsburg and the British hold up 10 miles away in Yorktown for just a few more months, winter would arrive. Armies rarely fought once the winter winds began blowing. We would benefit from such a circumstance, Ruth and me. Mr. Hallahan would surely have the coin to pay my, my tavern wages and our continued work in the laundry would pay for our lodging and meals. By spring, we'd be in fine fettle and ready to walk home to Rhode Island. I amused myself by imagining that one day I might serve General Washington his chicken pie. I'd offer the suggestion of the army overwintering in Williamsburg and he'd see it at, it at once as a brilliant military tactic and he'd give me a Spanish silver dollar for being so clever. Such thoughts were proof that I was much in need of some sleep. All right, we will stop there and discuss these two chapters on Monday in person or distance learners on Zoom. Um, make your jots in your notebooks and I look forward to speaking about these chapters with you. Also, thanks for my teacher appreciation week flowers. They make me happy. Have a good weekend. See you all on Monday. Thanks for listening.